Hello, thank you for joining us for this virtual program, Food for Thought, a toast to Blondell with, with Nesanit Abegizis. I think I did that really bad, but we'll try it again. <laughs> I'm Joshua Oduga, Public Programs and Exhibitions Manager at Art and Practice, and we are very excited to share this virtual program with you. This program is organized in association with Art and Practice's current exhibition, Blondo Cummings, Dance as Moving Pictures, a co-presentation with the Getty Research Institute. The exhibition is on view in Lamert Park until February 2022. For this program, we welcome entrepreneur, educator, and experimental filmmaker, Nez Abegaz. Nez works as the co-owner of Asla, a plant-based Ethiopian restaurant in Lamert Park, a lot, which allows her to combine her passion for food, community, and storytelling into her daily practice. In addition to being a restaurant owner, Nez is a filmmaker. Um, her first short film, Bereka, premiered and won the Best Experimental Film Award at the Black Star Film Festival in 2019. Hi, Ness. Hi, Joshua. <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Doing really well. Really glad to be doing this with you. I feel like we met each other during all the craziness that has been happening, and it's really interesting to finally be doing this with you. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of context for this program before we jump into it. Um, during Blondell's career, she created a series of dance works titled Food for Thought. These works included a suite of performances collected on a single tape that represented Cummings' kinetic meditation on the importance and specificity of food. In many of Cummings' works, um, she often used meals and food as the basis for her dances and the themes that they explored. For Blondell, food was an entry point by which she explored not only her own work, uh, but those of her collaborators and people that she observed. So for this program series, Food for Thought, we wanted to invite three women who also use food as ways to share stories, cultures, and understanding to share a story with all of us. Um, so Ness, I think when we met each other, I very much met you because of Asla um, and our connection being in the community of Lemur Park. Uh, but in that first meeting, I, I became aware of you being a filmmaker and I quickly went off and tried to search for as much of your work as I could. Um, and one of the things that really struck me <clears throat> is the connection between your work as a filmmaker and the restaurant. Um, so I really wanted to invite you to come into this storytelling program because it just made so much sense. I see food and filmmaking as two like essential tools of storytelling. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about what the film that we're going to view is and then we'll kind of get into it. Sure. Um, so yeah, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's been uh, really great getting to know you and the team at Art and Practice and really excited for this ex exhibit you guys have going on right now, honoring the life of Blondell Cummings um, and just so honored to, to be um, here doing a toast to her and her life's work. Um, but yeah, in terms of this piece specifically, this one kind of came out really organically. Um, I was participating in a sound design workshop actually run by Garrett Bradley um, that was put on by the Studio Museum of Harlem and MoMA. And, um, you know, we were kind of tasked to kind of think about sound in, in new ways. And so um, I was working with a good friend of mine, actually, who's also a resident here in Lamert Park. His name is Samir Toure. And we started collaborating, just thinking about um, kind of both of our interest in Pan-Africanism um, and, and kind of like some of the, the, the stories that you don't always hear. Um, and so, I was looking at some Super 8 footage that I had collected from Ethiopia. Some, um, maybe I think I was there, this was from early 2019 um, when I was an artist in residence at the Echo Park Film Center and kind of just, you know, said, hey, Samir, what would you do with this? I wanna, you know, I'll, I'll start by saying in the beginning of the film, there's a short snippet of um, a traditional singer from Ethiopia, which um, often are referred to as Asmari. Um, kind of doing a tribute to my father. Um, and so you'll hear her say, Teshagar Abagaz. And so I had, you know, just sent him some field recordings of like traditional music um, and just wanted Samir to play with it. And so he ended up incorporating the speech by Marcus Garvey. Um, and we just started, you know, uh, collaborating in this really organic way as part of this workshop. And then it, it kind of turned into this other piece and I ended up submitting it to Black Star Film Festival. And so it screened as part of the festival this year as well. That's amazing. I have so many questions about what you just said already, but we'll get into it really quickly. So yeah. give me one second. Sure. <laughs>
it a few different times since you sent it to me and I think every time I pick out a different thing um one of the things I wanted to ask you is I'm really interested in the multi-layered way in which you build stories um and I think I'm asking this question about your your film work and about the restaurant as well um for me it's really interesting and I think Blond working with Blondell and working on this exhibition really made me start thinking about this um the way that different people's experiences and different personalities can come into one person who's telling a story and embody you know what you're trying to do and then come across whether it's you know using uh, people's voices in your films like you know using family members voices or exploring family archives or even your personal archive which you mentioned that you know you had all this footage that you were using and, and you were going through it um i'm wondering what what motivates you to create in such an open manner like to, to create in a way where it's not just so much based on your own perspective and things like that. There's so many other factors. So that's the first part of the question. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, it's interesting the way that I came to filmmaking and like even um, the time in my life when I really started exploring it as, you know, actually making films. I mean, I've always been a huge lover of films and, you know, films have been instrumental in my life, you know, I always cite, um, you know, Haile Garima's first uh, documentary, Imperfect Journey, um, as being like a turning point in my life, watching that as a high school student and kind of, you know, without getting, you know, too far into that story, but just, just really understanding at that point the power of the moving image. And so it was always kind of involved, you know, I always was around filmmakers and kind of supporting and maybe helping to organize screens or, you know, maybe more in a like producer type role, you know, more with logistics and things like that. Um, but, you know, as a good immigrant child, I studied, you know, science, I studied human biology um, as an undergraduate and thought I'd, you know, do something with, with medicine or, or, you know, something in the sciences. I um, mean, so I never really saw that as like a viable thing that I could do um, as part of my life path, but was actually through the process of Asla and, um, you know, being in the kitchen with my mom, you know, and being with her for, you know, sometimes up to 14, 16 hours a day. Um, and just, you know, hearing stories. My mother's, you know, both my parents are amazing storytellers. And so I just naturally, you know, I'm also, I think I've always, even since I was a little kid, I would like write down notes when my parents were telling me stories. <laughs> um, so I always, I think, in, in you know, um, subconsciously just really knew the power of archiving, you know, stories. And so I would just start on my iPhone, just, you know, recording my mom as she's telling me stories. And um, so it, you know, how I started making films was I, uh, my brother had actually introduced me to the folks at the Echo Park Film Center. He organized a screening there. And then eventually I took a six week course on documentary filmmaking um, using Super 8, all analog, like literally like cutting and splicing and taping film together and kind of really fell in love with, I'm all, I really fell in love with the like tactile nature and like, you know, just the physicality of working with film, you know, and, and the preciousness of like not wanting to waste because it's really expensive, <laughs> you know? Um, so in many ways, I think there is a parallel between like 
that process of how I learned how to make film and also working in the kitchen, right? Like you don't want to burn something that you just spent two hours sauteing some onions. You got to, you know, be careful and, and be mindful of, of, of all the um, ingredients. And so, um, so then from that six week, you know, course, um, I was actually invited to become an, an artist in residence. And that's really when I really started to say like, oh, I can actually make, make films. And so um, I think the fact that I wasn't formally trained like in a film school, um, in many ways for me is like a real blessing because I think I'm able to really just make one, I'm making films primarily for myself <laughs> and for me to like think through questions and really, like I said, archive, you know, stories and stories that are really important to me primarily about my family, but other folks that I really care for and histories that I really care about. Um, so it, it, my filmmaking is like this very organic process. It's not like I ever like seek, to, like I'm gonna make a film about this subject. It's just like, there's a question I'm thinking about and oftentimes I'll start, you know, looking at images, looking at footage that I've shot. And then like maybe, you know, later down the road I'll hear like some audio piece that I've recorded on my phone or something that I, you know, did years ago. And I'll be like, huh those two things look like they could be in conversation with one another. So it's a very, um, like I said, it's, it's almost like a recipe. It's like, you know, you got to, you know, my mom taught me, um, I guess I'll tell on myself when, it, my, when I first started cooking, when I moved to LA, my brother, he said something to me. He said, you know, he said, your food is, it, it has a lot of spices, but no flavor. And I was just like devastated. I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> but what I understood he was saying was that like, it's not just about throwing things in a pot, like there's timing, right? So there's, you know, when do you add that, that spice? How long do you caramelize the onion? You know, what, so all these layers that go into cooking, and, and I really feel like, like that's the same for film, you know, that it's all about, um, it, it's a really like a spiritual experience for me, you know, it's like really the story coming forth, um, you know, stories that, that I feel like want to be told and that for whatever reason I have access to that information and so um so yeah it's been a really interesting experience I, I I'm not sure if I answered your question I might be rambling but <laughs> but in many ways I think, I think totally, the way that I came to filmmaking you totally did answer my question and it's really interesting because the next part of my yeah. was is is your experience with storytelling grounded in any specific experiences and I think you just talked about a bunch of those like the Echo Park yeah. Film Center cooking with your mother um, your brother being an artist and, you know, you have a really amazing creative family and, and him having an experience and inviting that, inviting you into that and that being the catalyst for what you're doing. I think all of these things are really interesting. Um, and another thing I've been thinking about that this exhibition and Blondell's work has really made me think about is the way that storytelling and, and creating things is much, so much of a collaborative process. Um, you're collaborating with people around you and you're thinking about their stories and you're trying to figure out even the space where you're going to show your work and it's really interesting that you started off just learning at the Echo Park Film Center and then you became a resident there. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about and ask you about is collaboration, um, working collectively, you know, even as a filmmaker, the film that we just worked, it really sounded like it was shaped in the collaboration with your collaborator, um, the musician who helped you with the soundtrack. So I wanted to ask, um, when you're creating collectively with collaborators, are there any things that you think of specifically? Is there like a specific way that you go about collaborating? Um, and then just to kind of follow up on that, when you are doing a collaboration, are you thinking of so much of it as your final work that's your own thing? Or are you thinking about it kind of like a restaurant, you know, when you create the recipes and you're not there 24 seven, there's other people that are there cooking it and you kind of have to give up a little bit of ownership. Um, so I wanted to talk about that. I wanted to talk about collaboration and, and what you think about that. Yeah, yeah, no, um, you know, I, I love collaborating and I think it's, um, you know, even if it's not a like overt collaboration, you know, I think about like my first film, Baraka, and, you know, all of the music is my father playing traditional Ethiopian instruments. Um, you know, I think about, even though that was like a very internal process where I was really like learning how to edit, how to use Adobe Premiere as I was making the film, um, you know, but I, I think about my good friend, Russ Hamilton, who lives in the neighborhood, who I'd be like, Russ, how do you, what, what, how, I need to move this clip over here, what do I, and he would just stop by and be like, okay, now this is how you do it, and, you know, show me a shortcut 
or my friend Sandy, when I wanted to do the titles, I was like, you know, I really want them to, I want to do them handwritten. I want them to be like my handwriting. Um, and so Sandy's like, okay, well, I'm gonna, you know, so like from the graphics, um, and then, you know, ultimately I really think about like, you know, my, it's my mother and my niece who are really um, telling that story of Buttercup. It's really their voices. So like, to me, they're my ultimate collaborators. It's really their story that I'm just helping <laughs> to shape, um, you know, and, and really, so I think for me, like, I really think about, again, going back to the first storytellers that I fell in love with, which were my parents, you know, my parents just were so great, you know, as a young child, always instilling, whether it was, you know, stories of my, you know, ancestors, whether it was like my grandparents or things about Ethiopia, I obviously living in the diaspora growing up here, them always really wanting to connect us to our culture, to our history, to the sense of like dignity, um, you know, as Ethiopians. So I think, I think about that a lot. And I really feel like, you know, I'm just part of this lineage um, of people who, you know, whether for them it was sitting, you know, with their, their kids at a dinner table telling stories. For me, my medium might be, you know, Super 8 films. Um, but I really, yeah, in, in terms of this piece, Phyllis Wheatley that we just watched, um, that was, again, like, just really working with Samir and being like, hey, here are some different recordings that I have. What do you think? And him really kind of taking kind of these um, foundational pieces and being like, oh, we're going to talk about Pan-Africanism and Marcus Garvey. And then me being like, oh, wow, that would work really well with this footage um, of this Ethiopian church. You know, it really um, is like, and then, you know, the name of, of Phyllis Wheatley, you know, really wanting to honor this idea of Ethiopianism and, and kind of this resistance that Black folks had in this country, um, even during slavery, that was kind of a, you know, predecessor to Pan-Africanism to say, no, like we see ourselves as divine beings. We see you know, not even so much the idea of like the country Ethiopia, but just as a black people that we are in the Bible, like we are here, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And we are going to command that respect. Um, and so always wanting to just shine light. So to me, like she's a collaborator, right? Like these, all these people that kind of laid the, the groundwork and the foundation for me to be able to do what I'm doing and, and play and experiment. Um, to me, they're all, you know, my, my best collaborators. Yeah, that's such an amazing way to think about making work. And I think, you know, a lot of that, from my opinion and from my perspective and talking to a lot of different people might have to come from the way that you entered into it, right? Like thinking about your, your parents as storytellers and thinking about the Echo Park Film Center and all of those things. I think that's really amazing. And in viewing the Phyllis Wheatley work, one of the things that really struck me when you first sent it to me was the layered aspect of it. There's like so much going on, like even the title, the first thing I thought about before I even watched it, I was like, what, what is this going to be about? Having Hi. my experience, you know, thinking about who she is and, and her legacy and, and all of that. Um, and so I wanted to, and I, you also just told the story about what your brother was saying to you about the flavor of the, yeah. um, and in cooking and how that is such a layered process. And you got to think about when you're going to do something and how you're going to do it in such a way. So this is more of a technical question, really. And I wanted to ask you when you're working, how does that layered aspect of your work come come across in the filmmaking? Is that something you're thinking of when you're collecting footage, or is that something you're thinking of within the editing process a lot? Um, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, I mean, and first, you know, I just want to say before I move on to this part, I have to also just when we're talking about collaboration, I have to you know give a shout out to my mentor Lisa Marr from the Echo Park Film Center who was really instrumental in teaching me how to hand process my film. So all of that footage was hand processed. Um, some of it even with eco um, material. So they're very like, yeah. So I, I have to give it up to Lisa. I just wanted to say that real quick because I was thinking about it because she was in there with me and when my film was getting stuck and I'm like, oh, I accidentally put too much developer. You know, Lisa was just guiding me throughout that whole process. So yeah. shout out to Lisa. Um, but in terms of the layered aspect, it, I think it really for me comes in the edit. Um, you know, when I'm collecting, again, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'll say, I, I guess I shouldn't say I'll never do like a, you know, traditional narrative film where I like write a script and, and, but for me so far, my filmmaking process has really just been like observing, you know, just observing, you know, kind of, uh, documenting things as I'm, you know, watching them happen. And then those like pieces just end up becoming like these ingredients that later get mixed together to, to make the film. And oftentimes, like I said, the film really reveals itself to me. It's not even something I'm thinking about. It's, oh, I'm looking at footage and oh, here's some, you know, sound elements. What would these things look like together? You know, and sometimes I'll even, even with Buttercup, like I had initially done it, it was just my mother 
But something just kept nagging me where I was like, this isn't done. This is like, this is not the full story. And then later, like some months later, I was going through my, my you know, uh, voice memo on my phone and I heard, I had recorded my niece talking about our, her first trip back to Ethiopia and what that was like. And as I listened to it, I was like, oh, wow. Like that paired with my mom's story, that's the story. It's this full circle, you know, story of a family leaving Ethiopia and then this like, you know, third generation returning and this idea of like finding home again. And so oftentimes, like I said, it's a very non-linear process. I may think like I'm done with the film and then later find something that's like, oh no, that needs to be added. And, um, with Phyllis Sweetly in particular, the um, initial footage, like I said, I had shot, I think it was either in 28, I wanna say end of 2018, early 2019. Um, and, you know, a lot of times people will think because of, you know, just the, the nature of Super 8 film, but also just Ethiopia is just such um, an ancient place that people be like, where did you find this archival footage? And I'm like, uh, in my parents' neighborhood last week. <laughs> you know? um, so I feel like, you know, um, there's those layers. And I remember even I, I screened this uh, Phyllis Wheatley when I was first working on it for my nieces and nephew um, in Ethiopia, actually this last summer when we were together. And my niece was like, you know, there's almost like a paranormal element. She's like, I'm seeing like other things happening in the film. Um, and so I feel like just the nature of film too, there's like that layer, especially with the, you know, pan process. It's like, there's, you know, quote unquote mistakes where, you know, there might be some chemistry or the film might've gotten stuck together. But to me, that's like part of it. You know what I mean? That's like part of the story. And it's very, um, again, when I talk about like, there's like a spiritual element to the process. Um, it was interesting for her to pick up on that. And, I, and now as I look at it, I'm like, oh yeah, I am seeing like some energy. I saw this time <laughs> in viewing it. And I don't know if that's because of some things that's been happening with me. I've watched some sci-fi movies over the weekend and mm. stuff like that. But it, I think that's really interesting because, you know, I, I assumed that the footage was something that you shot recently, just because <laughs> I've talked to you about your work and your travels and that stuff, stuff like that. But I could very much see someone viewing it and saying like, hey, this is some archival footage. And then this is, I think my third or fourth viewing of the work, I did sense a little bit of a paranormal element. Um, mm -hmm. And then with the narration, I was like, there's something else going on here. Um, and one of those things I think that's really amazing and something I'm learning about film um, and just to take it back to Blondell, like the videos that are in the exhibition as well, mm -hmm. the environment in which you view a film in, it changes everything as well. Um, so I think with the work that you're making and the layered nature of it, it's really interesting to have like these repeat screenings of it. And even if it's like a private thing, you showing it for your family, that has to change, I would assume, the way you think about film as a filmmaker. Um, so I'm interested to see things that you make in the future, because uh, I think that that mode of filmmaking is something that really interests me. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, is there anything that you want to add? Um, to the end, like in, in terms of the film or in terms of your work in general? Before we hmm. No, again, I think it's, um, you know, for me, like I said, I guess I'll just say that, you know, I feel really blessed to be able to have, you know, the time and space to be able to experiment and, and you know, tell these stories and, um, you know, be able to do so much that I love, you know, and, and you know, recently I, I discovered, I mean, I had heard of her, and, but really kind of um, during the pandemic really started studying Miss um, Verda May Smart Grosvenor. And I don't know if you know her, but uh, amazing, uh, you know, chef, writer, I, you know, a costume design, she's designed costumes for Sun Ra <laughs> at one point, but just this amazing person. And, and, you know, it's been such a blessing to be able to encounter women like Miss Verda May, because um, in many ways, I think it gives me permission to explore all my passions. Sometimes, you know, you feel mm -hmm. like you have to choose, you know, um, but I think, you know, with you know, dy dynamic women, you know, even like someone like my mother who, you know, came out of retirement to start her, you know, restaurant, <laughs> something that she'd always dreamt of. It's, it's a real blessing to be able to have permission to really think about nourishment, what nourishes me in this very multi-dimensional, multi-layered way, and to not feel like, you know, film is separate from food, is separate from, but it's really, you know, like I said, I think the way that my parents raised it, it's all storytelling. You know, my father's really into fashion. He's like the sharpest dressed man I've ever met. And, you know, for him, he was like, you know, the way you show up and the way you step out into the way is telling a story. You know what I'm saying? And and whether it's, you know, I just woke up and I'm disheveled, that's one story. But, you know, I, I really appreciate as I get older, just like, um, 
my mom and dad who just really, um, yeah, just imparted on me the, the importance of storytelling and that you can tell stories in the way that you plate, up, you know, something and then the colors that you're using in your food presentation to, you know, filmmaking, to music. You know, my father, like I said, self-taught musician. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's funny because in many ways, my parents are like, I don't understand. Like, you went to Stanford and UCLA. Like, why are you, you know, using these weird old cameras and like in the kitchen massaging kale? But when I really um, look back, I'm like, you know, my parents have always been artists and they've always, um, you know, really shown us the beauty of art and, and really living in an artful way. So um, just, man, grateful to be able to do that, you know? Yeah, that's such an amazing way, I think, to end this specific program series, The Food for Thought. Um, it's just one of those things. It's like sometimes people do need that feeling of, you know, permission especially in the world that we live in nowadays, where it's like people might tell you you need to put your head down and focus on one thing. Um, and, but I, I love that you that you said that. And I really appreciate you for doing that and for all the work that you do in terms of, you know, storytelling and things like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this, Josh. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Take care. <laughs>